سبحان من تعن الوجوه لجوده وله السجود أوجه عجباه سبحان من شهدت بوحدته الورى رب Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to welcome you again to another episode of our program, Journey on the Path of Guidance. We are at the home of our brother John Graf from Houston, Texas, and we are here to have a conversation with him about his journey on the, ba- on the path of guidance. Thank you for having us at your home, brother John. Sure, welcome. Let me start. The issue of faith is extremely important issue to a lot of people in this century. Actually, many people call this century the century of spirituality. I would like to give me, I would like for you to give us a little uh, background about yourself, your life, your education, and how your path to the guidance started, and how you became a Muslim. You know, I come from a typical Christian family. My parents were actually, um, when I was very young, they were involved in the Mormon faith. My father's from Utah, mother's from Arizona. And they left this when I was like around eight years old, okay, after like going through all the rituals and stuff, being even baptized in the church and this and that. And they um, started to try out different religions. When I say different religions, I don't mean like, different religions outside of Christianity, just whatever's here in the United States to go try. So what is there but Christianity at that time? And so each week they would go to different um, churches and different denominations, trying out different, uh, Presbyterian mainly, even though I went to a Catholic high school. Went to a Catholic high school and each week we would go to different churches, sometimes Methodist, sometimes, like I said, Presbyterian and different uh, Lutheran, different denominations. So. Each week was a new kind of experience. They were trying to find a place where they could feel comfortable, hear nice talks, so on and so forth. But in reality, they were not very religious. However, my upbringing was exposed to all walks and different uh, flavors of Christianity, so to speak. Uh, I had friends that were of fundamentalist, uh, evangelical origins, Baptists, and what have you. And so I used to spend time with them and at camps and things like this. This is my background. Where did you grow up exactly, geographically? Where can you locate this upbringing? Uh, although I was born in California, I was pretty much raised the most of my life in Oklahoma City. And that's, you know, until I was even 30 years old. Career-wise, uh, education-wise, can you give me a little bit uh, that? Well, my... my Part of my childhood, my one of my maybe talents or interests was music. So I learned. Interesting. I learned actually from my father. Very interesting. Uh, although he became a doctor uh, when he was young, he was in a rock band and played guitar and things like this. So when Amazing. I was 13, I learned to play piano and play guitar. And he had a talent for music and singing, and I kind of picked that up from him, or I would say, you know, give I don't know, not credit to him, but. As people say, this is where you got your talent. And so I learned to play guitar from him and started playing all sorts of songs. I even wrote many songs of my, myself and uh, played in talent shows. And so much so in high school that when I went to college, you know, what do you know what to do with your life? So you, you go with what your interest is and what you're good at. So I went into music. So I became a music major. And then I experienced all different styles of music. I went into like uh, from musicals to operas and uh, singing. And you much. graduated from? I graduated uh, what university? Uh, from the University, Southwestern Oklahoma State University in a town called Weatherford, Oklahoma, uh, in music education. So to gear myself to being a teacher and to being a, a vocal music teacher, uh, conducting choirs and so on. And this is what I did even in student teaching, which kind of leads to my story of how I eventually came to the path of guidance. And, became religious, but not in the um, typical, not 
you know, Th that's what I want you to talk about your religious path during your music career. Then, when the shift started toward Islam, when your interest started. Well, it all really started when I was in the last year in my student teaching. So I went to do student teaching, and we went on a snow skiing trip. The choir went, and I went as the student teacher there with the choir um, in Colorado. And I used to snow ski many times. But what happened on the last day uh, during the snow skiing, I was on the last time down the mountain, as I was skiing very fast to try to avoid someone, I hit a tree. And so when this happened, I was laying there, I couldn't stand up, I didn't know what was wrong with me. And so, and I even felt like maybe I would die. And I was praying to God this time and asking for another chance, asking for God to give me a chance to search for the truth, to take life, you know, serious. You know, I used to drive fast and reckless and not think that I was uh, vulnerable, that I could go at any time, but at this moment I felt very much not ready. And so I asked God for another chance and that if I, you know, that I would go and look for the truth and when I find it, I would follow it. And so they took me down the mountain and took me to the hospital there in Denver, Colorado. And what happened is when they came back from their different scans and tests. It came back on one, I think, CAT scan that what happened is I tore my aorta. This is the artery uh, that comes off of the heart, the major artery of the body. So and you had so a major injury, basically. Serious. So serious that uh, to be alive with in this condition is extremely, extremely rare. It was completely transected, Amazing. and so they took me into surgery, Amazing. emergency surgery, to repair it. And then when I come out of it, even the doctor himself is telling me that you must have some purpose. You know, most people do not even survive this type of injury. And the nurses and saying things like this is kind of like a miracle you should. So I felt like I need to, you know, change my career, change my focus. Even I went At into what healthcare. Age? Exactly. I was 25. 25. 25. This was in 1999. And so I changed my interest entirely away from music into health. So my father, Interesting. Of course, my father yeah. being a physician, I used to work at his clinic sometime growing up. But I wanted to work going to public health. And so I went to Oklahoma University in Oklahoma City, a uh, health science center there to study public health. Uh, that's where I got my master's degree, first from OU. And that's where I met Muslims for the first time. My that whole was life, your first contact my first, with Muslims? Yeah, my, yeah, I mean, of course. In Oklahoma uh, City. Of course, the experience that people have and what they, the conceptions or what they think Muslims are, Islam is about, uh, that's all something you just hearsay until you finally meet some Muslims. And I met them, yeah, for the first time in my life at 25. And really, I was quite taken back and surprised at everything they had said about Islam, that it was not what, you know, it's not what people were saying necessarily. Could you elaborate a little bit on these things? I'm, I'm sure during your growing up, you heard a lot of things about many other religions too, but especially Islam, there was some kind of, a lot of misunderstanding about the religion of Islam and a lot of misconceptions. Add to that the animosity between East and West, the United mm -hmm. States and the Middle East, the, they give it a religious flavor, basically, and Islam got a bad name. So tell us a little bit about that, those impressions. Your first contact with the Muslims, how, how, how did that affect your first contact? Well, in, this was in 1999. Of course, it was before September 11th. So um, the reputation was not good even at that time. Correct. But it wasn't as bad as it would be after 9-11. And of course, all of this is associated with, uh, like you said, a religious flavor, like it must have some sort of religious source. And so now I get to ask, as they say, you know, uh, f you know, from the horse's mouth, you know, I get to find out from the source. Muslims, now you explain to me what your religion is about. And it's not like what, you know, some people would think. That, so I asked them about, what do you all believe? Of course, the belief in the oneness of God, the belief in Jesus as a prophet, these things um, shock many people. Now, I myself confused the religion, religion of Islam for all other Eastern religions. Like, aren't they like Hindus or something, worshiping different idols? And I knew there was a place called the Kaaba and this and that. 
But what I didn't know is that Muslims, of course, didn't worship the Kaaba. This is a sacred house built by the Prophet Abraham, and that they didn't believe that they were coming with any type of new religion, but the concept of surrendering to God was something preached by all the prophets, and that, that they believed in Jesus as a prophet was the biggest thing that struck me. Because from my upbringing and my experience with Christianity, you have a lot of questions, a lot of unanswered questions, and a lot of things that don't make sense if you want to make sense, maybe if you want your mind to make sense of religion, which is uh, natural for human beings to, to have clarity, especially when it comes to God and the next life, you know. And I told you my experience to want to be sure. And these questions are unanswered, really, like the confusion of um, who is God? And what is the role Jesus was playing? And when they told me that he was just a prophet and that uh, he surrendered to God and he taught people and called people to worship God and not to himself, this is something that I had actually come to this conclusion, so to speak, on myself. your own, on my own. Beautiful. From my own reading of the Bible growing up. Not so much listening to what ministers or preachers are saying, but from my own study of the book. You know, when I look at okay. the teachings and the things that Jesus was calling to, and the message of the prophets before, it was clear that they were calling people to God and to worship God. And so, uh, I, when people came along later and, and said that God has become a man and things that didn't compute logically to me, um, basically believing in the oneness of God and they and there and people like Muslims are telling me that God is one um, I said I have no hesitation to accept what your the message you're basically calling me to the only question was I had to learn about who is Muhammad yes because I didn't know anything about Muhammad uh, and then of course after so basically the issue of God the, the concept of God was clear in your head. The oneness of God did not add up with him being a man because there is no need for God to be a man to know what man experienced. He created man. That's what it was in your mind? In, in All that of that or? rings a big bell, you know, with me. It, uh, it makes perfect sense, you know. Yes. So how, how could that work? You know, I look at myself, why can't I, why can't I be God? Why can't you be God? Um, because I'm a man. Was Jesus a man? He was a man. Okay. But he was a special man, like prophets right. before, like he referred to himself as a prophet. And, and I, un, my understanding of what a prophet was is someone who spoke God's words, but was not in fact God, was receiving revelation and was telling people how to get to heaven. And what, so basically clarifying what is good and what is evil. Because man, if left on their own, they're going to justify what they want as good for themselves depending on their desires, uh, now, personal. Now the question of Muhammad, the messenger yeah. of Islam, or the last messenger of Islam actually, that's what we like to call him. He's the final messenger of Islam, the only religion God approved for mankind, which is submitting yourself to God, submitting your will to the will of God. You didn't know anything at all about the prophet. No. You had no, no idea, negative or positive. No, so, I didn't realize that he was calling people to the same message, calling people to God, to the God of Abraham, following right. the same religion that Abraham right. was right. following, uh, not coming with a different message or different, even the laws, essentially the same that were given to Moses. So this was a big shock to me. Now, of course, someone has to ascertain or determine uh, with certainty that this is in fact the case, and that can only be done through study. Uh, to look at it in an objective or analytical view. So I read many books. Books even talking about prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, God's peace and blessings be upon him, were mentioned in the Bible itself. And in fact, the books that I read about that were some of the most convincing to me. There were books about scientific miracles and as mentioned in the Quran and how could a man such as Muhammad who lived in the desert you know, 1400 years ago know so much about astronomy and know so much about geology and all the different sciences those were quite convincing of course but the thing that really shocked me the most was the force the forecoming or the prophesizing basically of a prophet that would come after Jesus another one that would come after Jesus 
And that could not be explained except through uh, Muhammad. What attracted you more or uh, pulled you toward studying more and getting deeper into the religion before you took your shahada? Yeah, so declaring when, I, Islam. when I declared my faith in Islam, of course, which consists of the oneness of God, belief in the absolute you know, uniqueness of God, and then, of course, that Muhammad was the final and last prophet. You know, not w within that would be believing in Jesus in this in the light of him as just as a prophet and a guide to, to mankind and a light which he was for that time for a people, but not for all people. When did that point come? Did anybody push you? Did anybody pressure you? The people you, that or? I met in college. Mm -hmm. So I met a few friends from Pakistan and one who was from Egypt. And it was my contact with them that surprised me. Their character was much different than uh, I was expecting. You know, very humble, um, very honest, very straightforward. Um, something that you would not experience if you went to, for example, many churches where you can question you know, put people on the spot and say, no, make sense of this, explain this. And so I put them on the spot and asked them all these questions and were very surprised at how clear the answers were from then. And not just that, it was their character, their selflessness and their um, sincerity, not just to God, but, you know, because they prayed five times a day and, um, and I, I'd stop and watch them pray and I'd be reading sometimes in some different books about Islam and, um, it just became clearer and clearer that the purpose in life was to follow God's will, to surrender to God. That, you know, and only in that can someone find peace and sec security, and that's what actually the word Islam means in Arabic too. For those who wouldn't know, and I didn't know at the time, but that's what I found. And so it was in the holy month of Ramadan, I think that I, um, it was Ramadan at that time that I, testified, uh, this entered into the faith, formally embraced Islam. 99 or 2000? This was in 2000. It was in 2000. November 2000. Right. So you took your shahada, you prophesied that I, I am professed. a Muslim. You professed that there is only one God and Muhammad is his final messenger. And since then, you started a journey, of course, of learning and yeah. growing in the faith. But before we get into that, tell me about your public life now with the community you grew up with, with your parents, with your friends, and when, when, what was the reaction and how did you handle the reaction? Especially you came back, you came from a religious background basically, uh, although they traveled mm -hmm. from one church to another, but they still attached to the concept of religion. And they were looking for a home themselves to call this is our religion. I wouldn't say they were looking for a home so much as they were looking for a place to feel comfortable and to feel like that they were still um, having some spirituality. Every human being needs some spirituality. So what that was the parents' reaction? Those needs. Uh, the parents' reaction, the friends' reaction, and all your acquaintance and people you um, know? Well, I just left the university I graduated from. No, before I was in like a fraternity and all these kind of things. So you have all the social network that you move away from. Uh, I was in a new place. You know, I didn't have um, some, I had some friends I grew up with, of course. And I kept my relations with them even till today. I keep my relations with them well. Um, my parents' reaction, as you asked, was not as bad as many people would think. In fact, it was, I think, not much of a surprise to them because they knew my friends and my father met some of my close friends and he liked them as people he was surprised at how good their character was and so on and so forth Excellent. he liked them as people so it wasn't a problem maybe they thought it was a phase I was going through who knows what was going through their mind and as time as time goes on they start to realize okay wait he's serious about this because like I said from the moment I met them and received information from them about the, the faith and kind of sat back and studied it and thought about it they were quite a few months that I'd read and studied and asked a lot of questions. I wanted to be very sure. I didn't want to be someone who did something because of some sort of emotional experience that they went through and then they're going to later regret it. I wanted to make sure it was the right thing. And then even after someone embraces the faith, they would read and, and uh, learn knowledge. Like even the first command in the Quran is 
to call or command people to read and to learn knowledge. And so I did that to the best of my ability. I memorized maybe one, then the first year, uh, first two or three years, I memorized one part of 30 parts of the Quran and then a few parts as years go on. And all this, just memorizing and reciting them and singing them, like I used to sing songs in Italian and French and German when I was in college, singing in operas and different things like this. So it was a just an adjustment from one language to another for me, but I applied my um, training or skills that I learned in, and the in the university. God has given you also, it's in, a talent really. Into a new genre of music, which is maybe some people wouldn't refer to it as music, but it is you know, singing like God's words, kind of like the prophet David, peace be upon him, would sing the Psalms that God revealed to him. Exactly, exactly. And so that's what we do when we beautify the words of God in the Quran in its original, in the original tongue. So at home there was no resentment, which is good. Obviously your father, as you see, is an educated uh, person. He's a physician and your mother, I'm sure, is an educated woman. She's a psycho psychologist, basically. MashaAllah. So there was some acceptance in there. They were expecting mm -hmm. this. Uh, your friends in general, the ones you grew up with, now the old John is gone and here's a new one. Yeah. Uh, did you find any strange questions from them coming at no, you no, or because of the misconceptions? Now we're still in the 2000. We didn't get to 2001 yet. <laughs> so. No, I didn't. I didn't really find um, a strange reaction to them. Most of what uh, I receive from people is based around the media and politics. And so when you clarify to them tenets of the religion, you're basically entering a whole different category, that which they never really studied or know anything about. Uh, they're influenced by the actions of a minority of Muslims that would be out there, people claiming to be Muslims, um, doing things for political benefit. And um, so when I explain to them about the religion, they really don't have much background or knowledge in that. And they don't really have a problem okay. with it. I never received any problems with any of my friends or anything like that. So you graduated with a master's degree in Korea. How much you spend working in the public oh. health uh, field before you choose to go into your Arabic and Islamic study? I spent... And what made you decide, mm -hmm. I want to follow that path? Yeah. And again, you know, I went from one huge change from music into healthcare. Yes. And then eventually I went from that all the way into Islamic studies and learning Arabic and so on and so forth. So what made me change? Well, I spent about two years working in public health. Um, it was not exciting to me, definitely. A little bit, I wouldn't shy to say it was boring. Not, it, it, um, no. You know, when you find what you feel is a purpose in life that's clear, to worship God and to get closer to God and this becomes when you you know if someone finds religion in a general sense then and they incorporate that into their lives that tends to take front stage and so when I was given the opportunity like I said I worked for a few years in public health I was given the opportunity after that to go overseas and learn Arabic basically I was offered a scholarship to the community I was in I even went to Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, through like a scholarship. One year they were offering it to um, different communities around the United States for people who had converted or embraced the faith. And I was basically had the opportunity from my community in Oklahoma City to go to Hajj. So I went to Mecca, I went to Saudi Arabia, and I experienced the whole religious experience in the places where the Prophet Abraham and the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon them, both were at. And the rites of pilgrimage that took place in the early in the Bible in the beginning with the mother of Ishmael and and then finding the well and the well of water and all of this that's there in these stories that some Christians are very aware of and I'm there in the actual place where it took place is um, strengthen someone's faith definitely being in lands that are that are holy the prophets walked and that pushed me also to learn Arabic. I was there one day, I remember I got lost in Mina, there were thousands of tents and they all looked the same. And I couldn't communicate to anyone as a new Muslim. Uh, I didn't know Arabic. And we share, as Muslims, we would share the Arabic language 
in in our prayers when we pray but to communicate with someone I didn't understand what I was saying and I wanted so much to understand what I'm saying in my prayers and also of course the benefits worldly benefit of communicating with people and so I was trying to find a way after that really to learn Arabic and when I came back from Hajj I talked to different people and finally found um, some people in the community that were willing to sponsor me and a scholarship to come to Egypt and that's when life changed into a different category or a different journey adventure how long did you spend in Egypt where and what did you learn in this period of time well all in all I spent about close to six seven years in Egypt Mashallah. so far and I still have to go back and do some more studies you know, um, you know we you know, to follow the path of knowledge is not a path that has an end that's true so that's it true. continues Tell me a little bit about your family life, your wife, how you met, and how she found her path also to Islam, and take me from there to your trip to Egypt. Well, I knew my wife as a music student in college. And I was a vocal major. She was a f flautist who played the flute. And so um, I knew her from, from this time. And then when I left to go to study public health, I kept, you know, contact, kept up contact with her even though I left that city. And when I met my friends uh, and started learning about Islam through them, I would talk to her on the phone and explain to her about, you know, what is this that I'm finding out about religion. It's very extremely surprising, the information I'm finding out about the religion, not what I would have ever thought it was. And so I explained that to her and I felt that she had believed in the message of the oneness of God and you know all of the what Islam was calling to I felt that um, her heart was was open to you know faith in God and and that she would embrace submission to God and or Islam right and so a few years later she did you know she basically believed in it but was felt that oh it's too much for me to pray she wasn't at that point she didn't think that she could you know pray um, daily and um, this was just um, you know, a weakness that she had at the time, which or thoughts she was having, because once she started praying, actually embraced Islam, it was so easy for her to pray. You know, uh, I think she was just procrastinating, sitting on something good for a while. So after that, you went to Egypt to pursue your studies, the Arabic and Islamic study in Egypt. Yes. So uh, after uh, our marriage, we were married for about you know three or four years. We didn't have any children. We went overseas, you know, two couples uh, ready for an adventure. We're going to live in Egypt for a year, see how it is. And I went there and didn't know Arabic at the time. I think my first experience, the first week was the worst week I had. Not knowing how to communicate again, the same problem I had when I was in Saudi Arabia uh, and lost. And so I, the, what you call, they call them a simsar. In English, that would be equivalent to a... Um, what do you call the person who an agent an agent that wants to real estate agent real estate who wants to get you in a particular uh, hotel or not a hotel he we got put in a hotel but he wants me to and put money in an apartment and so he leaves me in this apartment paying a hundred hundred pounds a night look you know saying that now you need to sign the contract and live there for a year and I and he just left me there. I didn't know where to go, so I called my friend, um, Brother Soheib Webb, Imam Soheib Webb, I don't know if uh, yes. some of the viewers know, who's also a Many people. William Webb, who's now a uh, well-known Imam in Boston. I called him, because he's from Oklahoma City too, he was the Imam there when I became yes. uh, Muslim. I called him and said, you need to come find me and get me out of here. <laughs> and so he comes to where I'm at, and, and he takes me to his apartment, and actually there was an apartment there in the same building. To, I, we stayed with them for several days. Um, it was quite scary in the beginning. Very scary experience. But as the months culture go on, shock and culture the, shock, um, not being able to communicate with the people. So you cling to the other, yes. not expats, but whoever's there, the other students that are there and the con friends and connections you have there. And until you can learn to communicate with the people, and that takes about six to eight months before you can very start getting comfortable. Start getting comfortable with the taxi cab drivers. 
you gotta watch your yeah, back yeah. a lot because they want to run up the price on you the moment they realize you're not uh, native a Egyptian. <laughs> True. From your looks, and then when you when course, you speak, like when you speak, then they uh, often they want to it happened to me in Washington D.C. They, they think we're, that uh, they do that sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So th this is the way. Unfortunately, they have their own culture yeah. <laughs> all over the world. Yes. So you started studying in uh, Egypt. What school? What what institution? I studied you at a with? center for learning Arabic there called Ad Diwan. That many of my friends and people I knew before studied at, and um, I studied there for about five months, and then eventually left that center and studied with someone privately that I heard about was very good, who actually, my Arabic teacher, his name is Yasser. He's still my teacher today. I mean, still today I would sit with him and go over some high-level uh, books that I studied in the University of Al Azhar. Um, so I kept a good friend, like he's what I consider as a friend, but a mentor and a teacher. And him and another teacher I have from Syria. Uh, I keep, they're basically like my friends. And they helped later in guiding me and starting up a business, which I don't know if you Upon you finishing now. your basic studies, I know you still have uh, a little bit to go to get your degree, the yeah. BS in Islamic study from Al-Azhar University. Now you're back serving the Muslim community basically mm -hmm. uh, in the Houston area and somehow you have uh, made a famous name for yourself among the Muslim community. That's how we learned about you actually. Many people know about you. Yeah, brother Yahya, Imam Yahya. And we got interested to meet you. Tell me a little bit about the reception of the community, your uh, relationship with them the support you see, the problems that you might face in the community also, if there are, if there's any. And uh, what are you looking for forward in your path? And what do you like to see happening around you, whether within the Muslim community or the community at large? Well, that's a big question. Well, I see a I lot. I have a big answer. <laughs> <laughs> I see a lot of challenges uh, for Muslims living here in the West, whether they were uh, people who embraced the faith as converts or people who were who left their countries looking for a better way of life here and enjoying the um, enjoying you know living in America. Muslims have challenges here. The biggest challenges Muslims face, besides rectifying their own faith and being good examples. Uh, as far as conv conveying to the friends and neighbors and employees uh, character that is proper Islamic character reflecting you know what teachings of the prophets and that besides that being the first biggest challenge I would say basically communication to the people here and communicating to the people you know a clear uh, a clear example you know like I said actions and then of course in speaking to the people for Muslims to have a voice here is a difficult challenge for them to explain to other people what their take is on issues and how they're, of course, against terrorism and they're against these kind of acts, you know, these misconceptions, and then how they, you know, and I and I felt myself a big responsibility to articulate this to people, to stand up and and speak on behalf of Muslims, and at the same time speak to Muslims and remind them of what the religion is teaching them. You know, to be good, peaceful This is citizens. very important too, absolutely. Uh, so I felt, I don't know, somewhat of a calling to do this. I felt this responsibility that I have. Oh, well, there's a famous verse in the Quran which would translate to, um, and there has not been or I have not sent any prophet before except that they spoke the language of the people so that they can make it clear to them. And so myself speaking plain English and also learning Arabic, and having access to re original uh, religious texts, Correct. Um, then I felt this dual responsibility, you know, double weight on my shoulders, to guide the Muslims, to show them the path and clarify to them the religion that God yes. taught them, and the character they're supposed to be following, character that of um, being, you know, good to their neighbors and their guests, and, and so on and so forth, following the character of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. At the same time dealing with people of other faiths and, and articulating to them what is Islam and what isn't Islam. Tell me a little bit about this connection here. Here's this white American boy or man who came to Islam, 
later, in, you know, as a young man, went and studied Islam from its sources and came back now teaching the Muslims. First, give me the reaction of the Muslims. I mean, uh, how do you feel communicating Islam to them with them? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any um, hesitation to tell them what's right. I don't, um, and I didn't sense from them any kind of problem. Excellent. Meaning, this is part of Islam, you know, maybe people don't know this about Muslims, that they, that they should accept what is right and what is true from no matter who says it. Beautiful. There's a verse like that Very in the well Quran, said. to stand up for what's just and what's right, even if it's against your own selves. So for them to hear from my mouth, someone who's a convert, telling them about what their religion is teaching, they have to accept it. I mean, as Muslims, no matter who's saying it, no matter what their, the color of their skin is, or their background, or language, or so on and so forth. As long as they're saying what's right, and they have understanding, then they should follow it, or they should benefit What from are some of the challenges you see, not among the Muslims themselves only, within the whole community in general, especially after 9-11? All Muslims do have difficulties. Now, as an American Muslim who was born and raised, and your roots your family, family roots are in here. When some people look at you, you are one of us and now you're a Muslim. Do some people think of you, you abandoned your roots or do you have any challenges in that area, you or your family? No, when I think of my parents in regards to this question, they wouldn't think in any way that I've abandoned my roots or anything like this. Yeah. Because they're not very strongly rooted in some uh, form or in some formal Christian group that, that if you're not a part of it, if you're not with us, you're against us or something like this. No, they feel like that I'm trying to help the Muslim community and trying to um, help convey uh, what, is, what Muslims stand for, you know, in, in all that's right within Islam and, and what is true about the religion to the people here and they I think in general applaud me for that I've had my parents come to many of the different talks I've, I've given before and they support me as you know as a son maybe they themselves um, do not accept the, the, the faith as I've accepted it but of course they accept me as their son you know how you can't not love your, your and your they child. admire what you're doing but I'm they I'm admire sure. what I'm doing and they support me I have two younger brothers also and uh, they have no problems with what I'm doing. Beautiful. Now, I would like to shift the talk about the Islamic value, values, the Islamic values, Christian values, American values. Do you see any conflicts there for you? You grew up as an American, you grew up as a Christian, then you converted to Islam, you changed the set of values. Do you, see, do you see a lot of things, are, uh, those are in common in them, or you see any conflicts? I see with popular culture there would be some conflicts. Or I wouldn't want to use the word conflicts. I would say there would be some challenges. Challenges. Yeah, people... That's the popular culture. It's not the American values we're talking about. Um, yeah, popular culture. When you talk about American values, for example, to do things... Uh, to treat people in the business sense fairly and just and, and give everyone the, the, the right opportunity and the fair chance to, you know, in, in a business sense or talking about to do things very professionally, to do things, uh, to produce things that benefit people and quality and so on and so forth. Islam would embrace this as the teachings of Islam say. Okay. Muslims, some of them, um, some Muslims, particularly from overseas who have cultural baggage, may hesitate to embrace some of that. Okay. But this is the best part to, this is Absolutely. the part that they should embrace, because the religion calls them to embrace that. True. However, uh, morally, people have to, you know, I have children, I'm raising two children, I am c concerned about things, the negative influences that are out there, are, as are people of other faiths, to uh, not experience not about not expose them to anything, but to protect them from the harms and the indecencies that are out there in particularly unbridled popular culture. So I want to, you know, Islam encourages that. And so I'm on my guard in, the, in that regards. 
but so are people of, of other faiths who have moral um, principles that they have to uphold. Okay, so it's not that it doesn't mix, but uh, with but uh, popular culture is the issue. It's not American values. I have not seen a conflict between what I understand as American values and Islamic values Beautiful. in a general sense. I don't see any kind of conflict there. If you have, if you are having a conversation with a person who grew up in America and he has probably a Christian background or maybe no religious background whatsoever and he has some issues with Islam and he's searching, what would you say to him? And he has a background about, he's he may a Christian background? He might and he may not, but he is in, in a journey to searching for the truth. He has some questions like you had yourself while you were growing up about some questions uh, from the Bible, about the church, about the whole culture of the church itself. And things did not add, a, add up about the concept of God, the prophecy of Jesus or his uh, deity, let's say. What would you say to somebody who has some questions like this? Because some people, I talk to a lot of people, and they do struggle with some issues. And they don't find anybody to answer them clearly. Well, for me personally, Islam provided clarity at the, in the most important issue of religion, which is God. Understanding who God is. There's a famous verse in the Bible which talks is a statement of salvation to, from Jesus according to Christians who compiled the, these books where Jesus said that this is eternal life that they may know you the one true God so knowing God who God is is the paramount uh, objective for the creation so to have this be the uh, foundation of, of a religious teaching and to be confusion in it is a problem. It was a problem for me. And if someone doesn't like living with that problem, they should consider something else, particularly something that their logic agrees to, which is the ulti to say that God is ultimately and completely perfectly one. Sure. And that's easy for people to understand, where to explain God is the creation is a big conflict in defining um, the definition of what God is to begin with. To explain him as to say he's like a tree or he's like an egg or he's like this. Um, it doesn't compute. And it, it conflicts or contradicts the teachings of the prophets. That's true. It, con it contradicts the Bible. It contradicts all the Torah and the teaching of all the prophets even before Moses. Uh, finally, I would like to ask you something. Probably you heard it a lot before from people who interviewed you or came to listen to your, your lectures or sermons. If you have one advice to give to the Muslims in America to communicate Islam to the non-Muslims and the advice you might give to their listeners, what that would be? The biggest advice I would give to Muslims is that your actions speak louder than your words. And you have a religious obligation as a Muslim in the teachings and the advices of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and also in the commands given in the Quran itself to do certain things and to not do certain things. And so your words will not be listened to and not be heard or they may not even be heard at all, but your actions will make an impact. So as long as you're standing up for what's right with whoever group you're with, as long as you're standing up for what's right and for the good of society and you're trying to benefit others as the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him did and looked out for the other people no matter what their faith and religion was, to look out for the well-being as the famous story of the Prophet Muhammad was looking out for the well-being of a Jewish neighbor he had, and he looked in to see what was wrong with him, even though he would harm him. They'd look in and he found he was sick, and the reaction of this person was what guided him to the faith, because of the actions and the concern and the character of the person. So if Muslims would follow this type of 
character and uh, embrace it and interact with other people like yes. that, then this would make the biggest impact as far as fixing misconceptions that people may have about Islam and so on. That's my advice to the Muslims. Your advice to the, to the non-Muslims who are interested or they are in the search mode? Well, naturally, and many Muslims say this to people of other faiths, they say, you should judge a religion by the teachings of the religion and not by the, pra the, the, the practice of by the, the practice of Muslims. The practitioners, yes. Um, and it's hard to get past, you know, if you see, a, if you knew a particular Muslim that acted in some sort of shady way or did something wrong, um, to assume that, that, that they learn that from a religion is not a fair assumption, naturally. But to judge the religion by its teachings is a fair, is a fair, you know, because that's what it's all about anyways. To give Islam, you know, not I want to say a fair chance, but to judge it according to what it says and not according to what there may be a few people out there doing. Because if people, for example, in Christianity, if they were to judge Christianity just by what they saw on TV, they may see it, uh, they would only know what is negative. They would only see the controversy that happens when there's, um, if there was a priest that molested some boy, and, and this is talked about, and then people say, oh, well, that must be what they learned that from the religion. Of course, since we actually know Christians, and we know Christianity, and we're familiar with it, we wouldn't make that assumption. So why do we do that about other religions about like religion. Islam? Yes. And there are many other, you know, controversial things that come up on TV. For example, you have uh, some minister that embezzles a lot of money and uh, installed from the people. And this doesn't represent the teachings of the religion whatsoever. So we should give that same fair uh, judgment to other faiths. That's Absolutely. my advice. Thank you so much, Brother John. Thank you for being with us for this program. And I hope and I pray we see you again. We'll leave you with the greeting of Islam. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you. Subhanallah, man, shahidat bi wahdati lo.